All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Says Pop Online, Says Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Steve Stazak, who is in Charlotte, North Carolina, correct? Yes, sir. Excellent. And Steve is a motivational speaker, facilitates professional speaking training and team building events worldwide. Uh, he's been a top business sales manager before getting into coaching and training. And today what we wanted to talk about is how to be a more persuasive speaker, because let's face it, uh, you know, speaking for salespeople, for sales leaders and and just in general, it's something that uh, you can continuously improve upon. And nowadays, when you're doing some of this virtually as well, uh, you've got to learn some new skill sets, right, Steve? That's right. Um, so talk, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, what are some of the fundamentals of becoming a more persuasive speaker? Well, uh, John, I started out in the uh, leadership field, uh, started out with a couple a couple leadership companies teaching public speaking. One of the, I guess, the most crucial things I learned in the public, when I was apprenticing to be a public speaking trainer, was a little formula called IAB. It's incident, I is incidents, A is action, and B is benefit. President, or President Abraham Lincoln spoke at the Gettysburg Address probably about mm, two hours and 20 minutes less than his pre- the, the, the person before him, Everett Everett, who was a statesman. He had all these accolades. Are you familiar with that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Abraham Lincoln spoke less than three seconds, but whose speech do you remember? Well, obviously, the Abraham Lincoln Gettysburg Address is the most famous one, right? Right. So what Abraham Lincoln did was he actually came up with this formula. He told a story about the uh, the horrors of the war and the, and the casualties and the battlefield and why we're, you know the accounts of why we were fighting in the first place. And he told that story at the Gettysburg Address. And when he told that story, after he told the story, he prescribed, that was the incidents, that was the story, that's the I. After that, he prescribed an action. He said, so if we come together and mend fences, put our differences behind us, and then the benefit, we will become one great nation. So it sounds simple, and it sounds very trite, but that's to become a persuasive speaker. What a lot of people do, what they lack is when they're given presentations, is they don't close out their speech properly. Mm-hmm. So for example, uh, you've got to have a title. You've got to have a title that's a solution to what somebody came in to see. For instance, if I was in a homeowner's associate, if I was in a homeowner's association for my neighborhood, it was my turn to speak and give, you know, uh, somewhat, a somewhat informative, mm-hmm. you know, uh, presentation. I'd say, well, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to, I'm going to, this is the title of my speech. The title of my speech is how anyone, how easy it is for anyone to build a deck in three weeks or less. Right. Get it? Mm-hmm. So as she comes in, that's solving a problem with, you know, the folks that come in there that, that, that now does not exclude women, people that first time people that in carpentry. And, you know, a lot of people want to get their hands in home improvement. So you're going to, you're going to perk up the audience. Mm-hmm. They can come up with three major points. Those three major points may be materials to use, um, uh, help me out here. Well, anyway, two other, two other main points. Sure. When you're giving your presentation, I say today's topic is how easy it is for anyone to build a deck in three weeks or less. Number one, I'm going to discuss the materials, the materials that you use. It isn't that expensive. Then things mm-hmm. in terms of the cost isn't expensive as you think, and it's not as labor intensive. And then maybe somewhere in there, maybe you reconstruct one of them where you know you don't have to go out and buy hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of tools. Right. So after you get done with the presentation. What you're going to do to wrap it up, most people just end it. When they give a presentation or speech, they just end it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where you often get the, uh, you know, people end their speech with, uh, well, um, okay, well, thank you. Yeah. Any any questions? And it all gets a little awkward. I mean, the speech might have been going great, but that point is always a little awkward, right? That's correct. So what you do in the end instead of that is you say, so, by doing point number one, point number two, and point number three, you're going over it again. 
you will be able to, anyone, anyone will be, and you, and you tie it back into the solution. That's why, that's the way people remember it. And that's what Abraham Lincoln did. And that's why they don't remember the Gettysburg Address. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the get is, his speech during the getting perfect grass. Yeah. So, so then how do you, so this is a good formula for people, for people to use. But I think sometimes, um, even with the first part, people struggle with, especially if it's say it's a, it's a, it's a sales presentation or it's a presentation to a group of people, or it's an online presentation is, People tend to ramble around the beginning of it rather than, as you say, you know, setting it up with a a, a very con a very compact and, and focused idea of what's going to be talked about. They tend to sort of ramble and kind of go all over the place and try to sort of paint pictures at the beginning rather than focus. That's right. They try. To, they think they're 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 getting. Well, one thing you do you do want to do is you want to build a little rapport with the audience. Mm -hmm. So recently, I'm contracting with a company where I actually go and do the persuasive speaking myself. So I'm walking, the, I'm talking, talking, walking the walk, and I'm promoting regenerative medicine around the country. So when I go in, I build a little rapport with the folks um, by asking them how familiar they are, how, how familiar they've been with stem cell mm -hmm. medicine, you know, what, what's their awareness. I get a little blurb about myself, very short, where I'm from, little joke, if I'm up in Canada, you know, the weather contrast, mm -hmm. and then get right into it, like you say. Um, but yeah, people tend to do that, and I think it's maybe because may, they might lack, a, they, may be, they may be unsure of how to approach the audience. Mm -hmm. So a little warm up in the beginning, and then you want to go right to your PowerPoint or what have you. You know, today I'm going to, you can just slide right in there with the after the report and say, you know, I know most of you folks were, are eager to learn about so-and-so and then, bam, go into the title. Yeah. So how do you help people? As I said at the, at the beginning, one of the, one of the major challenges that we see nowadays is that a lot of presentations are now not done face-to-face, -face, right? They're done virtually. They're done uh -huh. like we're doing here. And this is and this is a challenge for people because sometimes you know maybe your audience isn't visible they may not have their camera on or whatever and you still have to give a persuasive presentation but with zero feedback from the room right uh -huh. so often so how do you how do you advise people when they're approaching virtual presentation Well I would think there'd be some kind of form of feedback because I've been through those before where people can somehow you know, press a button and, and acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. But I've been through many trainings where they have to mute, you know, because they don't want any questions mm -hmm. to upset the flow of the presentation. What I would do was I, I would probably maybe throw some um, uh, rhetorical questions out there. Right. Or better yet, I would probably do some audience buy-in, even though I couldn't hear back from them. Mm -hmm. I would say, oh, wouldn't you think this would be, wouldn't this, wouldn't this, you know, so just to get their participation even at the end. Right. Yeah, because it definitely is a, a growing a growing challenge for people uh, when they're not always in front of in front of people. Another part is, uh, you know, how do you help people simply overcome the fear of presenting, right? Uh, because even people who have to do it as a job, sometimes it's the part of their job they hate. You know, they, they're they great one-on-one, -on -one, but if you put them in front of a group of people, they're like, oh. Everybody has an issue. Well, not everybody, but people that have fear have issues, and you got to find out what that issue is. A lot of people think, and this is what used to go through my mind, it's when you're standing up there, you're almost like naked, like people can see right through your mind. Mm -hmm. Like if you have any other extraneous thoughts or thought about the audience or unconfident feelings that people can, you know, people can read those. That's one thing. There's, there's 10 public speaking tips that I think, and I've, I've studied them up, down, and sideways, but one of them is 90% of your nervousness doesn't show. Mm -hmm. um, try, try to find a friendly face in the audience. Friendly or receptive face. Receptive is key. Because you don't know what people what people have on their minds when people get intimidated when they're looking around the audience, right? Yeah. So look for that receptive face because you don't know what's going through their mind. And when you do, it'll make you feel more confident. Yeah. And I think the other thing too is what I always say to people is is the audience wants you to be good. 
They want you to succeed. They're not sitting there hoping that you crash and burn. So, you know, you've got a, You've got an audience who who wants you. Nobody wants to watch somebody who's struggling, right? It's not it's it's not a pleasant yeah. experience for anybody. Uh, so then, how do you help people? Okay, how do you help people? Um, bring some more dynamism to the present because that's the other part so maybe you get over the fear but you're just dull right you're just boring oh and you just you're just going through it monotone slide by slide and everybody's falling asleep no so what i have one one component i have in my public speaking class and incidentally each section the reason these things work for people our classes work and they work mm -hmm. for everybody i've never had somebody say that they didn't but it's a two-day class and we do a we, we, you learn a section, you practice it with a partner, with somebody in the room, then you perform it. But getting to your point, I have an overcorrection exercise. And so what I do is I have them read something really boring. Matter of fact, I, I read the alternative minimum tax method. Ouch. <laughs> when I get through with that, it sounds like I told a Disney story out loud. <laughs> so what you do is you go way to the right. Okay, you, you break out, you break out, because a lot of people may be afraid to be over-enthusiastic, right? Mm -hmm. So I go through that. Uh, that's one of the things that I do in the, um, uh, in the class, an overcorrection exercise. There's some other little things that we do, but that's one of the major things. And, yeah, and I think uh, one of the other things is uh, is is people have to connect with their own material. Right? You have to believe in what you're presenting. I mean, I think if you go in and you just think, oh, I don't really, you know, I don't really believe in what I'm saying. I don't really believe in this product. I mean, it's really hard to come across excited or enthusiastic or or genuine, right? So, public speaking tip number eight: um, be an expert on your topic. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not, even if I'm not, like, I, I don't have a medical background, but when I do these regenerative medicine seminars, I believe in them, and I get enthusiastic about seeing, you know, about some of the results that I've seen and, you know, some of the things, potentials it has. So I buy into it, and I get enthusiastic, which is point no, or uh, public speaking tip number seven, because the more enthusiastic you are about your product, your audience will be too. <laughs> <laughs> So what are a couple of things that you would advise uh, somebody to do? Maybe somebody who gives, who has to speak, you know, regularly or whatever. What are some ways they can start to take maybe some inventory of how well they're doing? Uh, let's, let's see. Can you refer to Okay, some inventory of how they're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people have critiques on, you know, like, for instance, I'm actually doing a, a, a one-off for a public speaking coaching for the person that's heading, heading up the Wells Fargo Championship here in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And he, when I first came in, I said, so tell me what you want to help with. And most people are willing and have been taking their own inventory and they tell you, well, I've got too many ums and ahs. I'm a little dull. I don't know how to punch things out. Um, I get nervous this way. I, my hands, I have issues with my hands, <laughs> which a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. and, and so, those, I simply ask them. Yeah, and then so how then do you help them to overcome these? And because sometimes, let's face it, sometimes you can think that you have a problem with something, but when when somebody from the outside takes a look at it, and they say, "Well, that's not actually what your problem is. You've got actually problems over here." Right. So, so how do you, so how do you help people? I mean, because I could come to you and say, "Oh, listen, Steve, you know this is my issue. I'm waving my hands too much." But you then watch me and you go, "It's it's not your hands. It's something else." I mean, so how do you help people focus in on the right things? Well, as they go through the course, <clears throat> you know, you can find out what the issue is. You know, maybe they're flailing their hands because somehow, some way, they're nervous. Mm -hmm. I tell people, I say, if you are nervous. Use your hands to dispense some energy. I mean, some people are just have more abundant energy than others. Mm -hmm. um, how to detect other issues? That's just sort of an experience, experiential thing that I find out when I'm doing the workshop. Like, for instance, this person didn't tell me uh, most recently that they were their pauses were almost like. Um, that right there, <laughs> or like their homes, okay. So they had a funny way of doing a, you know, funny way of of doing an um because somebody probably said don't do ums and they got 
they still have that nervousness. Right. Uh, it's it's it, it's really fascinating though when you see that um how much people beat themselves up over over things right and how they get how you know public speaking can you know become such a bit you know can can create such um you know fear as we said in people because they think that there's so many components to it but coming back from to your formula i mean your formula is a pretty straightforward one to follow right yeah it takes it, it takes it really t- it sounds simple, but when you have people come up there and practice and do it, they somehow, some way, run that action into the benefit. But you gotta, you gotta separate them. You gotta just. And what I do in my public speaking class is I work on stories first. Mm-hmm. I'm using hands now. I work on stories first. I get the story down. And I say, okay, now tell me the action, the action you want people to take. And the benefit they're going to receive from doing it. Boom! I say, go up there and tell your story, and then just simply at the, at the end of it, say, "This is the action I want you to take, and this is the benefit." Like your parents, mm-hmm. when your kids, they, they just say, "Go and be the tr- or go fix this or go do a chore." Well, you did. They never told you why you <laughs> do something, right? Yeah. The benefit that somebody would receive from doing it, if you did, maybe half fifty percent of the time you would. You know, yeah. you listen to that, right? Yeah, probably, probably not, but yeah. But at least you know. At least you'd think about it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's it. That's in. That's interesting. It is, um, and I think what you're hitting on here is that difference between the action you want to take and the benefit. That's very easy to confuse those or conflate them, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the action might be honest to take it. If they do that, this is a benefit they're going to receive. Mm-hmm. Right. So in in the last few minutes we have uh, Steve. Um, what else? What other quick piece of advice would you give to people to improve their uh, to improve their speaking? And then tell us a little bit more about yourself and how people can learn more about you and uh, you know sure. come to some of your classes. Well, here's the thing. So a lot of people, you know, they say, "Well, I don't have any problems with public speaking." I had a girl one time in one of my classes say. Yeah, I was in the debate team and everything. She went up to the made her first presentation. She just folded. Mm-hmm. So for one thing, you need to be modest and true to yourself. Seriously. Mm-hmm. Sometimes the quietest people, the people on the lowest rung of the ladder, usually come, turn out to be the best speakers in the class. Mm-hmm. I'll say this. I've seen a lot of people speak. For one thing, never put your hands in front of you because you're creating a a barrier to the audience. Oh, I see a lot of people. I see them doing that in commercials on TV and things or what have you, insurance commercials. They do the finger thing um, or put, you know. The other thing is, and I've seen a lot of speakers do this, they pace back and forth in front of, you know. And people think, you know, that you're not Tony Robbins, Okay. But you're not the iconic where they're going to follow you everywhere. Well, when you do that, people are twisting their neck back and forth, and they start not to get it all because you're going all over the place. That's one of my pet peeves I would suggest not to do. <clears throat> the other thing, too, is a lot of people think that if they memorize a presentation or try to recite it word for word, that they're going to make the, have the perfect presentation. Mm-hmm. And that's not, I used to be tempted, everybody's tempted to do that. And when you do, what happens is, is you're going to lose your spot. You're inevitably going to lose your spot. You're going to have to backtrack and it's going to bind your, it's going to bind your speech all mm. up. So that's, that's pretty important. You know, if you have to keep no cards, that's fine. But typically when you're doing a presentation, you're going to have those three bullet points on the yep. title up there. So your mind will remember what's behind those points. You'll have the story behind them. So, you know, yes, yeah. I say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, hopefully there's nothing worse than, you know, bringing up your third bullet point and then going, huh, I wonder what that was about. What was I thinking <laughs> when I wrote that? <laughs> memory exercises that are really good for that, seriously. <laughs> improve somebody's memory. Or, I mean, I'm not magic, but yeah. these, are, these are all Dale Carnegie-based theories, and you can yeah. improve somebody's mind, seriously by a good percentage of doing these in, in the class. It's, yeah. it's really interesting because people think in pictures mm-hmm. and that's sort of how this thing is oriented. But um, can I talk about my classes now? Yes, please do. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and your classes. 
So in the United States, I do I can do classes all around the country. I mean, I've done them for corporations. I've done them for Samsung, Toshiba, places like that. And then I do, uh, I guess what you want to call public speaking classes where I advertise. And then I can do them in different cities, mostly around here, North and South Carolina and Virginia and Georgia and things like that, D.C. There are two-day classes, and we cover everything under the sun. You make one investment, I mean, seriously, um, that two-day class should last you the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. um, because, like I said, you learn a spot, you learn a portion or a section, then you practice it, and then you perform. But after two days, if you don't know it, then there's something wrong because you're immersed in it. Yeah. Well, excellent. Well, listen, uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, this is uh, Steve Stajzak. Uh, my name is John Golden, Pipeliner, uh, CRM and uh, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine. It's been great. It's been fun talking with you and look yeah. forward to another expert interview really soon.